Do you know what really sucks? Is sitting down to edit your project and realizing that you have gaps in your coverage or shots missing? You need to have a really good, specific, and detailed shot list. Head over to filmmakersecrets.com slash shot list, S-H-O-T-L-I-S-T, to get a killer shot list template along with some training where I show you step-by-step exactly how to use it. We make it all about ourselves when we're applying for work. Maybe a little bit's insecurity, but we also think that our client values that. When in actuality, the most clients are hiring us because they don't understand enough about filmmaking video production to do what they need. And so we tend to try to differentiate ourselves in terms of production quality or gear or deliverables or any number of things when the client's just like, I need a video. I mean, sure, like, yeah, 6K sounds better than 4K. <laughs> you know, like these, these things, but we think that they understand. Filmmakers have the power to evoke emotion, inspire thought, and drive universal change in this world. Right now, a real seismic shift is happening in the film industry. This is your best chance to join a new filmmaking movement. You have been called to create an everlasting impact with your unmatched, deep desire to tell authentic stories. So how does a filmmaker thrive in an environment that is almost intentionally designed to bring you down? That is the question, and this podcast reveals the answer. What's happening, filmmakers? It's George VK. Welcome to the Filmmaker Secrets Podcast, episode number 63. I am so excited to introduce my next guest, Kevin Barber, who is a filmmaker, educator, marketer, and now entrepreneur. He's the creative director at Vibrary, which we're going to get into. But for now, Kevin, go ahead and say what's up to our filmmakers and reveal the one filmmaker secret that you've been keeping from us. Hello. Hello. Yes, I'm, I'm Kevin. Thanks for having me on, George. I appreciate it. Um, yes, filmmaking secret. I mean, it always matters the context and who you're talking to and all those things, as I'm sure everyone always qualifies. But one thing that really came comes to mind as I'm thinking about this is that at least what's helpful for me is that we tend to put way too many, way too much pressure, way too many high standards on and, and expectations on what we seek to do as filmmakers. And, you know, you could, if you know, Stephen Pressfield, like, war of art and like it's all sort of a similar idea but my my vamp on is that like we have to overcome that resistance we have to overcome that initial launch point by having the standards be in proportion to where you are in the process and just by that i mean like early on allowing that space for disciplined creativity or or curiosity um because early on i say disciplined quite often we're not going to get those ideas unless we just create that space, which has become more and more important. Uh, we can talk about how life has shifted a little later on, but having that discipline time, that space where you can be creative, you can ask questions to let your imagination do something without any expectations of results after that. And from there, then, yeah, you can get into the rest. But I, what I've found is that the quality of what happens later on like basically the longer I can prolong that period of trying to hatch it down or like lock it down. Like, this is what this is. This is what the scene has got to be. This is what it's got to look like. The the more I can ask questions early on and the longer I can extend that typically the better the process goes. And then, yeah, by the time you get to the end, you know, you got to make that edit as crispy as, as possible make that, you know, that, that color match perfectly. Great. That's detail time, but just don't get in that too quickly. Um, so that would be my, my main thing that I, I find continues to come back more and more, especially like during COVID and we can get into this later, like a lot of us have had time away from what we traditionally thought of as our, as work and as our, our creative, you know, however we worked as filmmakers before that. And so allowing this time to, to just go into it uh, a bit more open-minded and a bit more curious instead of like forcing ourselves into production as filmmakers quite often do. I got to make this now. Otherwise it's never going to happen. It's like, well, yeah, yes, there's a time for that, but allow the accumulation of these other things first. Um, and the last thing, because that's, that's the, the secret, but honest to God, just like 
community and how important that's become and forcing yourself into that. If there's anywhere to force yourself, I'd say it's community, like reaching out, you know, finding that, that connection, because that's what's going to move, move you forward in any way, whether that's your own projects or in a greater industry sense. And that's something I've had to remind myself of every day via post-it note on my desk. <laughs> Isn't <laughs> Have you funny? contacted someone in two days? No. Okay. <laughs> it, it, it's it. amazing to me because we hear these, uh, you know, these, th- this advice so often community relationships, it can't be talked about enough. Mm-hmm. And, you know, in the words of one of my guests, the relationships within this industry cannot be talked about enough because it's so important yet. We still have to continue to remind ourselves of that fact because it is one of the harder things for a lot of people, especially if you're an introvert, especially if you're a little bit, uh, you know, you have some social anxiety like myself, uh, you know, talking one on one, no problem. But whenever there's a larger group of people, I tend to clam up and, and get really kind of internal within myself. And it really helps to kind of reiterate that fact that as soon as you get over that threshold, you find the community that you feel welcomed in and belonging to. That's when true magic can happen because those relationships that you nurture and you give value to will then give back eventually, right? Yeah. And and it comes back to, you know, curiosity, even in relationships, right? Like I, I found that that becomes such an easier process when you are genuinely curious. Like, what are they up to? What makes them tick? What are, you know, what's going on? And and that can be one-on-one. And then community stems from that. Um, but just to put the focus off of ourselves, even if we are introverted. And um, I've just found this is actually since COVID, this is as we stay a bit more remote and as we stay a bit more uh at least in the film community that I've been part of, it's still just getting back to in-person things uh, that one good thing that could come of that is this remote uh, one-on-one aspect where it's now more okay to be like, Hey, you want to hop on a zoom call for 15 minutes? It's not, you know, it's like, let's just check in. And you know, is there something you're working on? I could help with or, or whatever um, that that's become sort of an easier way into the community aspect instead of like, Oh, I got to go to some mixer or some screening where I got to go over and, you know, <laughs> introduce Smooth myself to everyone, people, right. right. Which is still, <laughs> very valuable uh if you do it in a generous way and a curious way but there are these other ways now to develop more of a community and and one-on-one relationships that could extend because i think the bar has been low- lowered after we've all been you know isolated for so long um of obviously out of it faster more for some than others but uh but yeah so that's all. Yeah, definitely. And, you know, I appreciate your sentiment about uh, expectation. One of my past guests talked about uh, his musical that we shot, and he had all of these expectations of grand musical numbers, large dancing scenes. And what he took away from that whole experience is that your project really isn't supposed to be anything like don't drop those expectations and just let it be what it is. Um, That's amazing. Kevin, thank you so much for sharing all of that. I would love for you now to take me back, take me way, way back to that moment, that one singular point in time where you had the spark to become a storyteller. I know you've had vast experience, uh, you know, in, in the acting world, if, if I'm correct. Mm-hmm. Uh, what was that moment? Tell us that story. Yeah. I mean, it's <laughs> as everything qualified, but it's a, a succession of moments. I, I really fell into filmmaking itself because I, I was an actor and I, basically worked as a regional theater actor doing Shakespeare festivals and, and working at like equity Lord houses and sort of guest cast out of New York and go do that for six weeks to nine months, depending on what it was. And so I did that for about 10 years. And then in the middle there, I got into graduate school at a theater connected to a theater. And I had this weird chunk of time where I was like, I, I got in, so I can't really start get other jobs because they tend to be booked a few months out. So what am I doing? And I was just looking for something to fill the time. And I just started dating uh, my girlfriend, who is now my wife, ten years later. And she had just she had done some films of her own, and one of them had gone on and been in the IFC uh, program and like actually gone done some things. And I and we talked about the process a lot. And I realized like anyone can, not anyone can do this, but that it's much more accessible. And at that point, I'd also been working as a marketer for as my my side job um, for four or five years. And one of the things I learned to do was just shoot 
video with like an old Canon, like rebel, uh, right? Like the first one that had video on. Yeah, exactly. That was it. It was the T2i. I thought I got it for photos, but then ended up doing more video. But I was like, okay, so I understand visual vocabulary a little bit. And from that moment on, I just started consuming movies with a very different perspective. Like what was in the frame? How is it? What's the sequence? And very quickly, that became more of my love and focus. While I was at grad school, I was, I would do you know, I'd, I'd work in the theater during the day and take class. And then at like 11 to two in the morning was when I'd be working on my films. And so it was like this constant thing that propelled me so that I, after I graduated, I just kept, I acted for like another year before just being like, okay, I just want to write and direct and be a cinematographer. That was how I paid my bills. And also just, I love it. And, uh, and that, that was really how it continued after that. But, you know, I think back to, to the future, to the past and even how I played with action figures. I don't know if this is normal, but like, I would pretend that my eyes were the camera and I, I've, I made millions of movie trailers. And so I'd be like swirling and then, you know, in towards my eye and then like doing a close wide <laughs> angle. And like, and I just, I think of what it must've been like my parents looking at him just being like, what is this? Like, <laughs> what is he doing? So I don't know if that's normal, but I think I've always just visually been interested in that. And it just took a while to, to realize that was where my, my real passion was. Yeah. It's so fascinating. I'm seeing so many parallels between the way that I kind of came up with, you know, falling in love with acting and theater initially, and then having those imaginative sort of, uh, you know, striving for those imaginative ways to tell a story through film with the Mm -hmm. camera and being limited to, uh, you know, a, a few of those tools that you have to tell a story and, and, but yet having this vast open realm of possibility of you can really tell any story you want. There's a blank page, right? And then there are just an infinite amount of possibilities of what you can type, of what you can write about. And I, I think that's what I find so fascinating about the filmmaking world overall. Um, so we, we've talked about the past. Now take me to the present. Uh, yes. What is it that, that is happening in your life in the current moment before we get to Vibrary? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So I hope I'm pronouncing that correct. Vi- it- Vibrary. Yes. And okay. actually what's happening with Vibrary is we're renaming it <laughs> just okay, for that gotcha. exact reason. God save us. Um, <laughs> video library, Vibrary. What? That doesn't make sense. <laughs> um, yeah. So up to the present, I mean, everything really took a big shift. I Once COVID started, I had been working as a freelance filmmaker for four or five years at that point. And just gotten married. And then right before COVID hit my, we had my first and only child. Congratulations. Oh, thanks. Thanks. But it happened two months before COVID and then COVID hit. And so this complete life shift Mm -hmm. combined with the world shutting down and my livelihood shutting down for the most part. And I really had to look at and reevaluate how am I going to practically live this lifestyle through through the life stages here. And now that I have this responsibility and I, in the past had always thrown energy at filmmaking and just like willed things into existence by throwing massive amounts of energy until I just exploded. Couldn't do that anymore. It turns out when you have a kid, it's sort of <laughs> restrict. You have to prioritize it, makes it a little, a little bit more. difficult, right? <laughs> a, little, a little more challenging. And then combined with, um, with being isolated in our, our little apartment for that long. Um, what I realized, what came out of that was that I wanted to combine filmmaking more with marketing. Cause what I experienced was that a lot of free man, freelance filmmakers, uh, small production companies, they're all about the craft. They're, they're like, okay, I'm going to get work because I'm going to be better than everyone else. Or it's going to align with someone and they're going to really like what I do. But what I realized is that especially in this world now where video production itself was completely wonky, that it's more about how we connect with who we're serving, how well we understand their needs and are able to speak in their language so that we can have the strategy behind the video as well. And then also integrate it with how are they actually using it? Because how many of us have made these amazing videos that the client is raving about? And then they like, They get it and they put it on their website or YouTube and it just disappears. And they're like, oh, shoot. And then they don't bring you back because they're like, well, that didn't make us any money. It's like, well, they need the marketing component too. So 
that was the shift. Um, I did a lot of remote video production. I, I produced a whole series of like 12 uh, commercials for a solar agency that I remote directed with just the actor. I sent him a camera kit and then that was a fun experience. But during all that, I was thinking like, how can I make this viable for or, or valuable for an agency for a small business? And that's where Vibrary comes in because that was the video uh, production agency that I video marketing agency that I brought into existence, which really like so many other production companies, it's uh, scaled up and down based on the project. It was, it was still, it, it was me. And then my, my team of regulars who would help out. Um, but now in the present, I'm trying to keep what I learned from that marketing as time and bring that along with me, even though production work has opened up now and to make it more valuable. And so I have that on my own, which is doing work for clients. And then what I realized during that time too, was that from my time marketing there, I'd been, as I mentioned, marketing as my survival job for 10 years prior. There were a lot of things I was doing as a freelancer to, to convert clients, to you know, convert, that sounds very technical, but you know, to win clients to, over to, to get them to want to work with me instead of someone else or get them to respond to my messages. And there was a sales process that I developed during that time and then honed by being part of these other marketing communities. And I realized like that's really valuable for other freelancers. And so that's what I'm working on now, which is continuing to do video production work with that marketing component, but also to take what I've learned that's worked really well and then bring it into more of like an actual marketing system that's all tied around a piece of software that sort of is like a one-stop shop for helping freelancers manage their entire business. And that sounds, that's like a lot. I know I just spewed out a lot, but that's where my interest is now. So I'm developing that and alongside my work. So as things work with my, my own marketing and my own uh, freelancing, then I sort of spew that into this, this system. And, um, and yeah, just working with a couple of people now to sort of develop and beta and get feedback. And yeah, I'm excited about that as, as another project in the world. Right. Now, filmmaker listeners, if you are not watching this on YouTube, you can't see the large, stupid grin that I have because I'm so excited <laughs> to get into this. This is okay. something that I'm super interested in, and I'm excited to be talking with you, Kevin, uh, about this. So let's unpack all of that. Let's start with a very basic. What is the biggest mistake that you see filmmakers make in mm. terms of marketing themselves, marketing their work, marketing their services as freelancers? Hundred percent. Yeah, I touched on it briefly there, but the biggest thing that I found, that I find, is that we make it all about ourselves when we're applying for work, when we're trying to get connected, because maybe a little bit's insecurity, but we also think that our client values that. When in actuality, the most clients are hiring us because they don't understand enough about filmmaking, video production to do what they need. And so we tend to try to differentiate ourselves in terms of production quality or gear or deliverables or any number of things. When the client's just like, I need a video. I mean, sure. Like, yeah, 6K sounds better than 4K, <laughs> you know, like these, these things, but we think that they understand. So what I try to help people with and what I am always working on myself is to really understand who we're speaking to. So that research part, when you know you have a call coming up with someone or you, you're applying for a job or you get a referral, that first point of contact is to really research the company, research the industry, and then research the person and think, okay, where is that person in this company? Maybe they're solo, maybe they're part of a big company. What do they really need? And it typically comes down to needing a sense of reliability, uh, a sense of confidence that you will deliver what you promise in the time that you promise it. It's like basic things. But then also, uh, will you be able to understand the nuances of what they need in terms of storytelling so that they don't have to micromanage you? And so if you can convey that in that first point of contact, where it's like, hey, I see that your, your business does this. This is great. Um, I've done XYZ kind of video for people like you before and really found that XYZ uh, was helpful. I'd love to learn more about your project and let's set up a time, yada, yada. Um, that's much more helpful than, hi, you know, I'd love to be considered for your project. You can check out my portfolio. You know, this project is very similar, I think. So check it out. Let me know if I uh, think we could be a good fit. Love to talk. You know, it's like, it's just a very different thing. And then where they feel understood, 
then they're like, oh, this guy would be a good partner, a good collaborator instead of just a skilled person. Because when it's just about the skill, you're a commodity and you're going to end up competing on price. But when it's about the relationship and the trust and the proof of your past experience and ability to deliver, then you can price based on value and really start to, uh, you know, to, to get what you're worth, essentially, <laughs> honestly, and, and to, to be able to have the money to do the work that they need to the level that they need. Because if you undercut yourself on price, you end up slashing what they get or you end up burning out. And then, you know, it doesn't go well either way. I feel like we're getting a a filmmaker freelance masterclass for free. (laughs) Anytime. I love talking about this stuff for sure. Uh, Me too. So, uh, so we, we know the the part once we actually get a client, right? We, we know the relationship is super important. We, we understand that it's all about really understanding the needs of that brand, that business, that uh, marketer from that company that you're trying to entice to, to be able to hire you as, as a freelance filmmaker, videographer, what have you. But how do we actually get over the threshold of finding that client and finding the dream client that we actually want to work with that's not going to take up our time, waste our time with a $200 project that we can't even support ourselves, especially if we have a family to support. How do we get over that hump of actually understanding how to reach out to clients, how to find them, what is the correct client to be looking for? This is such a jungle. There are so many filmmakers out there. Where do we start? Yeah, that's that's the million dollar question, right? And so much of it depends on or starts with self-knowledge of what kind of work do you want to do so that you know who to find. So that's that's number one. I mean, you can I think the the lowest common denominator are the job boards kind of things like, oh, you know, upwork or or even Craigslist, what fun. Um <laughs> that there you're just at the mercy of market price and it's gonna be really hard. What the next level you can look at, or once you get past that, you really just need to start thinking about like niching down. And I know this is in marketer speak, people hear niching down, they think, oh man, they're going to make me just make like testimonial videos for pharmaceutical industries for the rest of my life. And that's not why I'm a freelancer, right? (laughs) And so that's where the mind goes that it's not good. But what I mean, when I mean niching, niching down is, yeah, maybe it's by industry. Okay. So maybe you're offering videos like what I did with Vibrary during the pandemic, which is uh, videos, marketing videos for solar marketers. And so everything was about how to make social media videos and full sequence from, you know, awareness building videos to education, you know, the whole thing just for them. That's one way to niche. Another way to niche is to make a specific kind of video, but for multiple kinds of people. And then there's the other kind of niching, which is having very well, and it bleeds into the next thing, which is having very clear messaging about what you offer, who you offer it for, because, and, and so you can sort of avoid the niching game by just having really good messaging, if that makes sense. Yeah. Um, so when it comes to where you want to start, but to find those ideal clients, a lot of it is what you're putting out into the world, but it's, it's also having that really honed messaging so that it'll, it brings people to you that you want. Um, that is sort of the top level thing. But of course, like what are the tactics, right? And so that's where you get into more hardcore marketing tactics because sure, referrals are amazing. Great. But then do you want to do cold outreach where if it is niched by industry, you can go find all these different people and look at what they have, look at what they don't have in their website or in their advertising, you can go to Facebook and see like what kinds of ads are they running? And you can look at their specific ads and say, Oh, well, that's not so great. So here, let me make these recommendations. You can do personalized outreach like that, um, which is time consuming, but then you're going for those specific clients that, you know, have deeper pockets that have this specific need and you understand their lingo because you've spent enough time researching them where you can speak in their language. Again, coming back to that understanding. Um, So you can do that. I don't recommend going near ads or like a lot of the more technical marketing stuff because that that's like a whole other skill and a whole other job in the first place, which will either cost you too much or you don't have the skill. Um, One other thing that I appreciate you saying that, by the way, sorry to interject uh, because I've fallen into that trap plenty of times in the past. I know a lot of filmmakers have. So I have to learn by (laughs) experience to repeat it. Yeah, because you need you need such a a volume and especially with paid ads, you need to run them for a long time to test and hone 
and get that message. And then once you get that, then you can make a killing, but you're going to be dropping, depending on the platform, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten 10 grand, just to like find what that specific copy is with a specific image with this, you know, and most of us freelancers don't have that ability. Um, one thing I want to, to say though, and I think a big missed opportunity in terms of finding other clients is tapping into local search. And this is something I've done a lot of SEO work over the years. And it's something that's actually now so much easier because of how Google reviews work. So it comes back to the messaging and then also using uh, local. And so what I mean by that is like, you can put yourself as a freelancer, you can get a business address for 10 bucks a month and you can get a Google my business profile. They just changed the name from Google My Business. So Google business profile, you show up in your local area and then custom tailor the creative, the text, the landing page, your website to what kind of work you want to get. And then lump it under video production services, mm-hmm. which is the category that typically freelancers would fall under. And if you're in New York, you're in LA, you're in a huge market, then you can go by neighborhood, which makes you a little more competitive. But then it's just like, it's a review game and then a relevancy game. So then you just reach out to your past clients, get some legitimate reviews. And it's really like the more reviews you have, and also the ones that mention what you do, what kind of service you want to offer people, what clients you want to get, Google finds that in the relevance. And quite often, at least in the past, I've gotten like, I worked as a freelance colorist when I was a cinematographer. There was a big overlap there. I got 80% of my color clients from SEO work. Wow. And it, it took a small, relatively small amount of time to get that up and running. So if you can do that, it's like, okay, clients coming in the door. And because you made the webpage, you made the copy, you made the images, you're inviting the people who already resonate with the kind of work you want to do to you. And then yeah. because they've already found you, then they typically will be willing to pay more because they already are interested enough to contact you. So there's, that's, that's a whole lot. I know, but I, I appreciate the, repeat, the replay, right? Yeah. So Kevin, are you telling me that I actually have to do hard and thoughtful work in order to attract <laughs> the right kind of clients to my, Look, to my business? You can do, you know, there is the easier way slightly. It depends on your client base. And I know that was a joke, but the, the <laughs> Also making the most of the clients and the collaborators that you have, you can call it referrals, but you know, if you look at how to make money, you can get more clients or you can resell ones you have or get referrals from the ones you have. And so like resell and referral. And so there are so many opportunities that we, we miss where we could reach out to people, past clients and be like, Hey, like you did an event shoot a year ago. Um, yeah, I see, you know, this was around the time wondering if you still need someone, you know, I know we did this thing. It was great working with you and blah, blah, blah. Like here's this, you know, be in touch or you can form a better offer than that. But that's something, how many of us do that? Maybe some do, but if you look at that across your clients, all of a sudden you can start really re-engaging. So yes. So without doing that hard, crazy work, you still can reactivate the network that you already have to, to increase what you can you know, the projects you can have as well. <laughs> so, so anyway, back to your joke. Aha, you're right. <laughs> no, that, awesome. that, I, that definitely compounds. I mean, it, it, it's amazing the, the power that it has and it all comes back to relationships, right? You're nurturing those relationships. Mm-hmm. Kevin, I have absolutely enjoyed this conversation. Unfortunately, we have to start working towards wrapping up and I you try to keep these a little shorter for, for my filmmakers so they can get them in sound bites. But I would love to get you back on the podcast because any kind of value that you bring to the filmmakers that are listening, I'm sure they appreciate a whole lot. Now, where can our filmmakers go to find out more about you, more about what you're doing, the business, the work? 100%. Super simple. KevinBarber.xyz. And I believe Instagram is at XYZ. I'm less active on social because I've been incubating recently. You know, slap my wrist. I'm working on a system <laughs> for that too, right? To automate that. There you go. Um, we got, I got to do that. Um, but yes, KevinBarber.xyz. And that has links to agency, to this filmmaker system I'm talking about, and then just portfolio. And you can contact me if please. And if anyone has any questions about anything we've talked about, I'd be happy to, to strike up a conversation there. That'd be cool. Perfect. There you go, filmmakers. Please check out the show notes. I'll have all the links down there. I have one final question for you, Kevin. Yeah. And this one is a doozy. Okay. If what is your deserted island movie? So if you could only watch one Ooh. film, 
for the rest of your life, what would it be? <laughs> am, am I being a masochist or uh, loving my life? Um, you choose. <laughs> honestly, the one I keep, this might be stereotypical in our, our field, but the, the one I keep coming back to, I watch about once a year. Can I answer two? Are you going to kill yeah, me on this? I'll give you, I'll right. give you two. Thank you. So for as a filmmaker, I keep coming back to There Will Be Blood. Okay. I, I could watch that stupid movie a million times because every time I see it, there's a different nuance or a different something going on there. And the craft of it, I just freaking lose my mind. Other than said Paul Dana's performance. I'm sorry, Paul. <laughs> um, everything else, it's perfect. Um, the other one might be goodwill hunting just because it wouldn't be my fault that I'd be on the island. Um, but also you just gotta feel the love, feel the love. That's, you need something that's uplifting. so meta. <laughs> yeah, I, I know. I'm like, why did that come into my head? I'm sure there are other lovely movies, but uh, yeah, that, that's that's the desert island. I get two movies. Suck it, y'all. <laughs> Sorry, I'll take back the profanity at the end of the, the program here. I'll bleep that out. This is a PG-13 <laughs> podcast, Kevin. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm a grown I'm up sometimes. All right. Well, thank you so much, Kevin. I appreciate you being on the Filmmaker Secrets it. podcast. Thanks, George. <laughs>you like that, then you are going to love my Cine Racing Challenge. This is a seven-day filmmaking competition where your mission, should you choose to accept it, is to write, shoot, and edit a short 60-second film in just seven days for your one chance to win with over $10,000 in prizes. So head over to CineRacing.com, that's C-I-N-E-R-A-C-I-N-G.com to get registered. Spots are filling up fast and the timer is ticking before the next Cine Racing Challenge launches. So be sure to head over to CineRacing.com right now to get registered. I'll see you over there.